Hello, I'm Earl Weinberg, and this is Book Circle Presents The Cavalry Cycle. This time we're going to continue our reading of Warm Yule, Horsepower Comes Home for Christmas. The way to the stores took them past the green. They saw the snow had brought down the star off the village Christmas tree. Well, that'll be a nuisance to get up again, Jenny remarked. They'll have to get the big ladder from the church again and whip up the scaffolding. You can't prop it against the tree. Rennie cast his eye over the tree, then said, Nah, we got this. Claude, you were kind of a daredevil in your youth, weren't you? I'm still in my youth. Exactly. He led them over to the tree and, guiding her by her shoulders, placed Jenny almost nose to branches with the star at her, with the star at her feet. It was shiny plastic and seemed undamaged. Jenny, stand there. Why? If I told you, you wouldn't do it. Claude, get on my back. How, he started, grab the straps in my harness and on the back of my jacket. Now step up on my shoulders. Don't worry, I'll hold on to your legs. Okay, I start to see. Willingly enough, Claude scrambled up Rennie, who grabbed his legs just under the knees. Jenny, hand me the star. She plucked it from the snow, brushed the residue off, and passed it to Rennie, who passed it up to Claude. Jenny faced the tree again. Full of uneasy surmise, she obeyed. I'm still way too low, Claude said. Rennie stood on his hind legs. Jenny heard Claude's yelp vanishing into the sky and looked up in time to see Rennie's forelegs waving above her. Stay put, he ordered. Two hooves, each the size of her head, touched down on her shoulders. Don't worry, I just need you for balance. How's it going, Claude? Through clenched teeth, Claude answered, You're squeezing my knees hard. You want me to ease my grip? No! The, s the star hung from a loop of light chain. Claude flailed but could not get the chain over the treetop. Rennie tried tilting forward slightly. Rennie, yelled Jenny, you're leaning on me. Lean back, I can't. Don't lean back, Claude insisted. Hang the star now, Rennie ordered. Carefully, or we have to do this all over again. Look okay? It'll do. Mm, okay. Get ready for the dismount. Stand perfectly straight. Which one? Jenny asked. Both of you. With just a slightly terrible force, he pushed off from Jenny's shoulders. Eight feet up, he tossed Claude off his own shoulders and caught him round the chest as he fell past. This muffled the gasp of fear. He sat down in the snow as slowly as he could, taking heed to keep his forehooves away from Jenny as she collapsed after her knees buckled from his push-off. He ended up lying in the snow, Claude in the lap of his forelegs, Jenny in Claude's lap. He looked up at the treetop. We did it. How could, what if, Jenny sputtered. I knew you could hold me and I knew I could catch him. Jenny, your fiance is a very brave man. Claude, your fiance is a very strong woman. I am going to turn you into dog food, Claude growled. Now, is that a nice thing to say? Anyway, I told you I got good agility scores. Did we say we did? You were showing off. So were you, Rennie answered calmly, and you knew I was going to do something like that when you got on my back. Jenny grumbled something about horseplay, but she gave Rennie a peck on the cheek as she scrambled up. So, has my personality changed a lot? He asked as he rose. Not nearly enough, she said. And why did I have to be the one to get squashed? Claude has longer arms. Rennie rose, found his hat, and shook the snow off. Looking up, he saw their stunt had been witnessed by a couple and a father with two kids. The kids started clapping. The couple joined in, but the father looked gobsmacked. Perhaps he worried his kids would want to try something similar. Rennie and his friends waved and smiled a little nervously and hurried on to their shopping. Limstow was a very small village. To go Christmas shopping necessarily meant going to the Jeans store. Mrs. Jean was the mage down the street. She found lost items, fine-tuned the public weather forecasts, interpreted dreams, usually as, it's just a dream, dearie, and produced a line of modest and reliable health potions when she wasn't running the store with her husband. 
The two did ghost busting on the side, calling in Father Claude on the tough ones. Not grim. You don't want to call me in on a ghost you care anything about, the church grim reminded the town about once a generation. Mrs. Jean spotted Rennie easily, of course, as he waded carefully through the crowd and smiled at him in the satisfaction of a job well done. She it was who found the seers who had told the Wardleys the transformation could cure Rennie. He waved and started toward her. Rennie was used to moving among humans simple from living among the civilians in standard cavalry in Otham, but this holiday crowd was a new proposition. Cavalry etiquette. Never switch your tail in a crowd, he reminded himself. Above all, never kick. He moved slowly, tipping his hat and saying excuse me both when he bumped into someone and when someone bumped into him. It was usually impossible to say which. In between collisions, he fielded questions. Rennie, is that really you? Yes, ma'am, still really me. How are you? Never better. Ren, how does it feel? I feel great, Kev. They let you out? I'm on Christmas leave, sir. Not, for instance, escaped. Rennie? Yes, sir. Hello, sir. Claude grabbed a red Santa hat off a rack and perched it on Rennie's head, taking custody of the cowboy hat. He's Santar Claus, he announced to the nearest targets. Rennie sighed, but left the hat on. How are you? Just great, Lou. How long does it last? Permanent. From a small child. What do you eat? What? Uh, what I did before, and a lot of oatmeal. He's Santar Claus, and a good sport is what he is. Thank you. Aren't you cold? In here? Uh, too big and furry now, ma'am. It was a little startling, the number of people who patted or stroked his back and flanks. Curiosity? Daring? Affection? Bravado? Everyone seemed welcoming or curious. He looked around for other reactions. A few faces gazed at him sadly, in pity perhaps. A few looked aghast. A few looked disapproving. Mr. Halbron. Rennie turned from his survey and found the man almost at his left shoulders. He did not want to be there. Apparently, he had been washed there by the tide of the crowd. Now he was edging away from Rennie, staring at him. But the pinched gray face bore a new expression. Before, he had looked on Rennie with revulsion, sometimes with some pity. Now he was afraid. The Halbron file opened in Rennie's mind. He remembered all the times Mr. Halbron had glared at him, or drawn away from him, or crossed the road to avoid him. He remembered crossing the road himself until his father told him not to. He remembered being shooed off the road, the public road, before the Halbron house for not passing quickly enough, as if he had the energy to burn. He remembered hearing away in the phrase get away or put away or something, never quite audible, muttered when he passed near. He recalled being 13 or so and taking his own turn, deviling, his mother had called it, coughing with theatrical juiciness for Mr. Halbron's benefit, or deliberately lingering before his house with Jenny and Claude. He arrived for trick-or-treat one Halloween on the Halbron doorstep, wrapped in a ragged sheet and holding a scythe from Jenny's garden shed. He made remarks in Halbron's hearing like, they say it's nothing the embalming won't fix. He had stopped joking about his illness after the first round of extreme unction, but he had picked up a bent for dark humor. He suddenly realized it was gone now. Poor Mr. Halpern. The skinny monster of sickness had, had come back as a burly monster of health. There was no pleasing some people. What an opportunity for deviling now. Rennie wondered if the thought showed in his eyes because Mr. Halbron glanced in his face and flinched. Rennie flinched back. He wondered if he shied from horsiness or would have done it anyway. In either case, the little temptation was over and he deliberately embraced his inner draft horse, steady and mild. He gave Mr. Holbron a flicker of a smile and saluted with a gentle wave. Then he turned away and closed the file in his mind. As Rennie reached the counter and was about to speak to Mrs. Jean, something landed on his back. It ran up his spine like a squirrel and jumped on his head, snatching the Santa hat off in flight. He jumped a few inches. 
Cavalry etiquette, never rear in a crowd. If you start to, stop and apologize. But no one had noticed his little hop. Grim, as the little dog monk, stood on the counter regarding the hat he held. Mrs. Jean had been about to speak to Rennie, but mage or no mage, she was now giving Grim the careful look people usually did when he appeared suddenly. Well now, what shall I be in the Christmas pageant this year? Grim asked the crowd. Father Christmas? He put on the hat. Or one of his elves? Technically, Rennie began, you are, or the Krampus. He snapped down on the Santa hat with a muzzle that had gone very long and toothy. Your sheepdog is fine, Rennie said. I was looking forward to it. Just don't bring in any real sheep again. Sheepdog it is then. Grim became the small gray dog, jumped back on Rennie's head, retraced his route down the back, then leapt off down among the ankles of the crowd. People held noticeably still for a few seconds, then began moving and talking normally. The hat was back on Rennie's head. What was that about? wondered Claude. Rennie met Mrs. Jean's eyes. She answered Claude in a low voice, Grimm's just reminded everyone that he's Rennie's friend. Rennie remembered the unwelcoming faces in the crowd behind him, the question about being let out, and Mr. Halburn. He thought about Darnley and Weldon, Charlie Horse and Buck Jack, spending Christmas he knew with no such protectors as Grimm, Father Quentin, Jenny, and Claude. Nor did they have his good excuse of change or die, how were they faring? He reached up and tugged the Santa hat more firmly into position. Look silly, not dangerous. He put on a determined smile and said loudly enough to be heard above the chatter, Mrs. Jean, your good idea saved my life. Thank you. She reached up to grab his neck for a hug, so he leaned down into it and kissed her cheek. The chatter lulled for a couple of seconds, then resumed, spiced with some laughter. Kindly, not snickering. Good enough. Mrs. Jean extracted a promise from him to come back when it was quiet and they could have a nice long talk. Then he drifted off into the crowd like any other shopper, only more conspicuous. The Jean store was deliberately miscellaneous, designed to save people trips to distant, unsundered towns. At Christmas, it was prime for supplying stocking stuffers and other minor presents, and Rennie so used it. Claude and Jenny did the same, with a certain amount of conspiring among the three of them, two keeping small Christmas secrets from the third. This made load loading Rennie's backpacks at checkout a little tricky, but they managed it. As they sauntered down the street to give Rennie a look at the old schoolhouse, they were overtaken by Grimm, looking like a solid gray Alsatian, padding along on a mission somewhere. Thank you, Grimm, Rennie called. The dog looked up. You're welcome. For what? Showing up at the jeans, Mrs. Jean explained what you did. Ah, that girl can see through more fog than most. Where are you bound? asked Jenny. To the burial plot at the Enfield farm. I'll spread some yuletide admonitions, more cheerful to do it by daylight. Who knows, maybe this year some of them will move on. Pray for it. Yes, Godfather, Jenny answered. Are you there, Godfather, too? Why, girl, of course. I've been fairy godfather to the whole town for over a thousand years. Hundreds of times I've stood at that font, he nodded back toward the church, and renounced Satan with the mortal godparents. And yet you won't go to... Yes, there's the rub of being immortal. I shall just have to wait for kingdom come. He had slackened his pace to talk with them. Now he stopped and sat. They stopped, too, and faced him respectfully. The road was empty for the moment and hushed with snow. René Auguste, the grim church grim said, I know nothing about the death of centaurs. Most likely after your last day, you'll gallop into paradise on four fine resurrected legs. But if there is some delay, if it turns out you are no longer as mortal as before, come to me and we will see what can be done. Rennie extended one foreleg and knelt on the other in his best bow. Thank you, Godfather. Most likely there'll be no difficulties. I speak out of my own ignorance. As for you, Jennifer Marie and Claude Michael, just keep your noses clean and keep on as you're going. The cavalry folk call the likes of you human simple for cause, and you can be grateful. Yes, Godfather. Yes, Godfather. He padded on and soon turned the corner that led to a country track. The schoolhouse was shut for the holidays, but they could peer through the windows and see the decorations. 
That was my desk, said Jenny, pointing out a piece of miniature furniture in the infant's room. I wouldn't fit in it now any more than you would, Rennie. Rennie shaded his eyes to peer through the reflections. There's mine, and there's the cot in the back where I'd go lay down when I had to. Or a cot. I hope they've changed it. As they started back toward the village center, he said, Thank you for making a place where I could fit. Thank you for making me welcome. Well, sure, Claude sputtered. Rennie, we couldn't have done anything else, Jenny exclaimed. Yes, you could. You didn't have to meet me last night. You didn't have to resolve to get used to me all over again. And my parents didn't have to rearrange furniture and lay in oatmeal. She's got 20 kilo sacks of it in the garage, just like in the mess at Uffham. And, and Grimm and Father Quentin and the Fabers, all of you could have said, he's all better now, job done, and just waved goodbye. Someone could sum up my life by saying I was born with a fatal disease and my only out was to be dehumanized. But I know I'm lucky, fortunate, blessed, any or all of those. Rennie, we really couldn't have done otherwise, Jenny insisted. You could, but you didn't. Thank you. Rennie dressed his best for the caroling. The red dress jacket with its white piping, the matching leggings, the blue cowboy hat, and the blue saddle blanket with the royal coat of arms. Along with his friends and family, he reported to the church for rehearsal with the other carolers. Mrs. De Lacey, the choir mistress, was delighted with his transformation. The horse lungs gave him resonance, volume, and duration. She asked him to come back sometime during his stay so she could teach him to lift his soft palate. Before he could ask where this was, it was time to run through the carols. Rennie knew better than to show off his volume, especially since he couldn't do harmony. After rehearsal, they assembled in front of the church to work out their staging. When they were done, Father Quentin stepped in front to deliver a blessing. But before he addressed God, he addressed the carolers. You might well be thinking of transformation this Christmas. Several people glanced at Rennie, then politely away. Claude and Jenny met his eyes and smiled. So did, fa so did Father Claude. His father, standing next to him, hugged him across the back. And that's fitting. Christmas is about transformations, though we don't often put it that way. God into man, sinners into saints, the kingdom of the world into the kingdom of heaven. Let Rennie's physical transformation, sickness into health, remind you of the profounder ones. Then he looked up and prayed that their music bring joy to the town. Something you could have taken for a small gargoyle launched out of the carvings over the door and landed on Rennie's shoulder. This time he didn't quite rear. You like jumping on me now, don't you? I get such a grand view from up here. Eight feet, did you say? Mr. Fitzhugh stepped out in front of the group and held up his phone. Everybody smile. Epilogue. Uffham Wood lay in the night of a January freeze. Eight soldiers of the dedicated cavalry and 12 of the standard cavalry, out on a wilderness survival exercise, were huddled around a fire, spending their brief downtime in passing phones around, looking at holiday pictures. What's this? That's a bunch of us singing carols in front of the church. There's me in back. Yes, horsepower, you're easy to spot. And what's that on your head? Our church grim. Looks like he's using your hat as an umbrella. Yeah, he's just clowning around. Those are my folks, and the couple next to them are my friends Jenny and Claude. They're engaged. Well, that's a Merry Christmas. Yeah, it was. I'll visit again next year if I can. And now we will begin Starry Yule. Charlie Horse comes home for Christmas. The monster arrived at dead of night, as was only appropriate. A lorry pulled up in front of a pair of houses hauling a large horse trailer. The houses shared a yard, now snowy, with a garage and driveway between them. Behind stood a patch of forest. Farm fields lay on the other side of the road. It was a fair way to the next house and further to the village, an ordinary unsundered place. A young woman got out of the lorry and listened. The nearest highway was far off and there was no other sound of traffic. No other sound at all, except for the lorry engine and a light wind sighing in the trees. Nor was there much to see. 
The sky was overcast and there were no lights in the houses. All the illumination came from the lorry's lights. The young woman walked back to the doors of the horse trailer and knocked. The doors opened and a large young man leaned out. Like her, he was wearing a jacket of military cut and a Stetson hat. He smiled down at her through a full beard. This the place, she asked. The GPS and the maps all said so, but she'd hate to abandon anyone here in the cold and dark, and it would not do to strand this passenger. The young man stepped out, revealing himself to be, from the waist down, a large dark bay horse. He glanced at the snowy yard lit by the headlights and said, yes, this is it. Thought they'd have the lights on, she said, then immediately wished she'd not spoken. Yes, me too, he answered. He wasn't smiling now. He leaned back in the trailer and pulled out several bulky pieces of luggage. Well, I shall rouse them out. Want me to wait until you're sure, until they come? The young man horse, Charles Darnley, Charlie horse, gazed down at her, giving the offer serious consideration. Until you're sure they're home, she had been about to say. And if not? If asked right now, would she take him back to the cavalry base at Uffham? Almost certainly. Kindness aside, you did not leave evidence of magic like himself lying carelessly about. That was ingrained into both of them. But, no, but thank you. They know I'm coming. After all, he had sent to them clearly enough a week ago and again yesterday. They just didn't know when to expect me. Still, they could have left lights on over the doors. She nodded, putting her hands in her pockets and shifting her feet. The wind was light but cold. Want help with the luggage? Charlie Horse was not sure where to put it. No, but thank you again. I'm sorry you've got such a long drive back to Uffham. Should he go with her? It's okay. I've got audio and stuff to listen to. She headed back to the cab of the lorry. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas to you too. Lift a glass for me. She got in, smiled and waved. Last chance, Charlie Horse. Pulled the lorry into the driveway, adroitly backed lorry and trailer out again, and headed back the way she'd come to the sparsely trafficked highway. And it was dark. He was the last delivery. Just as, it occurred to him, he had been the last of the class shot. Last June, on a brilliantly clear day, he had stood naked and human at the end of a line of six men on a green field. He had watched the other five get shot in the chest with magical arrows, fall over, warp and swell and change, growing legs and tails and fur. And then it had been his turn. Three of them had been his fellow passengers in the horse trailer. Weldon, Wardley, and Bryce dropped off one by one at their homes for Christmas leave met by their families in the cases of Wardley and Bryce. Danny Bryce had been dropped off a couple of hours ago at his family farm. It had been a merry meeting full of light and sound. There in the big floodlit farmyard had been Danny's parents and other relatives, at least two on four legs. Danny had five siblings, two sisters and three brothers. One brother, Ed, was well known to Charlie Horse by report. Danny idolized Big Brother Ed thoroughly enough to follow him into the dedicated cavalry and, like him, like Charlie Horse, be permanently transformed. A cheer went up when Danny emerged from the trailer and Ed had charged him, grinning, arms outspread. Danny had seemed to know what to expect. He had charged back. The brothers reared as they met and performed a kind of double hug, chest to chest and chest to chest, embracing with arms and, as well as they could, with forelegs. They pounded backs and laughed. When they disengaged and landed, Ed had given Danny's sweeping new beard a tug and boomed, look at you, look at you. Charlie Horse looked. Danny had been the shortest member of the class right after transformation, but now, after a growth spurt that had seemed itself almost magical, he was an inch or so taller than Ed, and like his brother, a ruddy chestnut, but more rangy. While Mrs. Bryce shoved one half-ton son aside to kiss the other, Mr. Bryce came over to shake hands with Charlie Horse. You've been a fine friend to Danny, he said. Danny called home often. He pined here a bit with no big brothers left around, but I think he's got five good ones now from what he tells me. 
That's very kind of him to say so, sir. Danny was only 16, the minimum age for recruits to the dedicated cavalry, and the youngest of the class by several years. Mr. Bryce and his sons shared a strong resemblance, from the waist up at least, and Charlie Horse briefly entertained an image of all three up on hooves. The father was cavalry too, like his wife and daughter, though he and the wife were long mustered out, and of course it had been the standard cavalry, not the dedicated. Danny's family had been supplying horses and soldiers to both cavalries for generations. And we'll hear a bit more about Danny and a lot more about Charlie next time.